When the natural loves become lawless, they do not merely do harm to other loves, they themselves cease to be the loves they were, to be loves at all. This is Pints with Jack, Season 5, Episode 5, The Four Loves, Chapter 2, Likings and Loves of the Subhuman, Part 3. Good morning, everyone. Pints with Jack is your favorite weekly C.S. Lewis podcast. We're three friends, Andrew, myself, and David, two Americans and an Englishman, break down and discuss the works of C.S. Lewis. This season, we're talking about love, slowly working our way through the four loves, the book where Lewis writes about affection, friendship, romance, and charity. And gentlemen, it is a pleasure to be back how have you guys been this past week? Well, uh, I'm doing well. We're uh, in Sarasota, Florida once again, uh, where my wife's family is, and uh, staying with my brother and sister, brother in law, sister in law again. And lovely to be back here. We get a we've been blessed to have a lot of time, and we're recording on the week of Thanksgiving, and it's actually C.S. Lewis's birthday. So before we started. Uh, or I'm sorry, his promotion day, the day that he became a saint. His birthday into eternal life. Yes. Uh, the 22nd of November is when we're recording. Um, so doing uh, doing quite well. Going to go see Max's uh, Most Reluctant Convert again tomorrow night. And uh, working on a paper about Lewis and autobiography and making some interesting discovering, discoveries there. How about you, Matt? What have you been up to? Ah, uh, you know, as we record this, I don't know if I have a the man flu, a mild cough, or the Rona, and only time will tw- tell. I will get myself tested only because it's, well, not only because, but because of the holidays coming up, just in case. I'm optimistic I'm vaccinated, so I'm optimistic it's just a classic cold or flu, but we will see. If it was man flu, you would know. but no i'm doing other than that i'm doing well i'm progressing beautifully through this book loved as i am cannot recommend it enough to you listeners really short book i think 100 pages sister miriam james so beautiful in six out of seven out of the nine chapters i have read so far have c.s lewis quotes starting out Uh. she loves c.s lewis so i plan on getting her on this podcast or at least inviting her and hoping she comes on because the title, Loved As I Am, you can already see how it could connect to this, this theme that we're talking about with the four loves. This, she particularly talks about it from the love of God and how he knows our heart completely. He's not deterred by our ugliness, our sinfulness, the walls we put up between us. And it's really moved me as someone who is very much performance-based. And so when I'm performing well in my spiritual practices, I assume God loves me more. And when life is a little bit messy and I'm not performing as well in my spiritual practices, I assume he loves me less. And we, we all know that that is wrong, but knowing it and believing it are two different things. And so reading this book has just been a really beautiful uh, reminder of that. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's great. David, how about yourself, my friend? Well, I've been doing a bunch of recording. Uh, I was recently on the Tolkien Road because John invited Dr. Holly Ordway and me onto his podcast to talk about Tolkien's opinion of Narnia. That was a lot of fun. Uh, And I've also been recording a few Skype sessions. This past week, I interviewed Murphy Thelen, who is filming Out of the Silent Planet using just his family. It is adorable. So he has his little kids being (laughs) Ransom and Divine. (laughs) So look look out for that one. And if you you have no idea what I'm talking about, go to pinesofjack.com slash blog, and you'll, you'll see the entry where I share the trailer and the first portion of episodes that they've recorded. Oh, so did we um did we come to the conclusion that Lewis did hate Tolkien? Oh, I'm sorry, Tolkien did hate Lewis, yeah. Uh no, no. Much overblown. I spoke with Walter Hooper once who said that um he went over to Tolkien's house and there was a well worn copy of the Chronicles of Narnia that Edith would read to all the grandchildren grandchildren. So Tolkien protested too much, I think. Yeah, that was one of the pieces of evidence that we brought up. Ah, oh, okay. I also have been getting on with the After Hours episodes, and I've interviewed uh, Norman Stone, who is writer, director, producer of a whole bunch of Lewis-related projects, but more recently, The Most Reluctant Convert. That was such a blast. 
I'm really looking forward to publishing that one. Uh, you mentioned to us that he was one of the friendliest people that you've that you've interviewed. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. yeah. <laughs> Well, and I just want to say that it's been a joy to hear some of the feedback from our listeners. It sounds like um, that y'all are enjoying the season, and we clearly are as well. Yes. Well, guys, let us go on to the drink of the week. And so I will tell you what I'm drinking last, because mine's a little special to today. But how about you guys go first? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, I'm drinking one of the scotches that you sent me. I'm drinking Glen Moray Fired Oak 10-Year. Let's hope this one's better than the one I gave you last week. <laughs> Actually, um, dirt uh, grass. Listeners, I got confused which week we were doing, so my tasting notes are on next week's. So I'll have to pick up something else. I have the Ledeg, um from the to- Tobimori um, Distillery, um, which used to be called Ledeg, and it's a ten-year, and it's uh, wonderfully peated. It says from the Isle of Mull, which sounds like a place I'd like to visit. So, what's the special whiskey you have, Matt? Yeah, I'm actually going to be taking a shot of it, and it's uh, it's a honey flavored from this factory called Roby Tussin. It's in this uh, really far <laughs> off land in Scotland. Uh, it's designed for se- <laughs> severe coughs, flus, and sore throats. It's the Roby whiskey. It's, it's going to get me through today. <laughs> when I was halfway through it, I realized I should have did it that way. <laughs> wow. Guys, this is a toast that if it's a man flu, as, as C.S. Lewis had once said, don't pray for good times or bad times, but the virtue to get through either of them. So whether this is this mild cough, the man flu, or the Rona, I pray for the virtue to handle them all like a champ. Well, and we lift our glasses to Lewis on the day of his promotion. And he also said, I wish uh, I always want to be sick enough to lie in bed and read books, but not too sick not to be able to enjoy them. <laughs> Let's hope for that. And we'd like to toast our new gold level supporter, Mara Peeper. Oh, yes. Cheers. 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 Oh, I need a chaser. Ooh. Ooh. That one's a bit angry. <laughs> I'm starting to, I'm starting to think these single scotches I picked up from England are are not that great. <laughs> well, single malt is better than no malt, and um, it's like bad Shakespeare is better than no Shakespeare. So I'm going to add a little bit of water, and we'll see where this goes. Well, while you're doing that, uh, I'm going to offer my recap of where we've got to so far in the book. In the introduction, Lewis spoke to us about need love and gift love, nearness by approach and nearness by likeness, and we were warned not to let loves become gods, lest they become demons. And for the last couple of weeks, we've been working through chapter two, which was likings and loves for the subhuman. And there we read about need pleasures, which are short-lived and must be preceded by some kind of desire in order to be pleasures, and they foreshadow need loves. And these were contrasted with pleasures of appreciation, which are pleasures in and of themselves, and they demand our attention, and these foreshadow appreciative love. Then, last week, we read the section which described the love of nature. And this isn't a love of beauty or views or plants or animals, but the spirits and moods of nature. And we read how Lewis rejects the idea that nature is a teacher, uh, but he does believe that it can be used to clothe our theology. And finally, Lewis ended that section on love of nature by showing how it is just as susceptible to demonic corruption as any of the other loves, if we allow it to become a god. Anything to add, gents? Well, the one thing that really jumped out to me last week that I wanted to add, that I really was glad that Lewis had added. We've been talking about how love, when it becomes a god, becomes a demon. And I like how in this chapter, he, or the the last episode, he says, and demons will let us down. As much as that's just a small little comment, I think there's just so much wisdom to that. Anything in life that is not meant to be held up to godlike status, any earthly pleasure, anything that's only supposed to be enjoyed in the right proportion, in the right way, that is is held up to become a god and becomes a demon, will let us down. And if you think of your own personal experience from that, we all can relate to that. We've all seen that. And we've all had those things in our lives that constantly let us down because we we hold them up to be more than what they were ever meant to be. Well, Matt, and yeah, and I love that. I think that that's an excellent perspective. It, it, I keep mentioning this essay, first and second things, you know, and when we put first things in the place of second things, things are going to go awry. And when we place second things in the place of first things, and I think that that speaks into what we're talking about this week with patriotism. It's a good thing 
um, but it has to be in its right place. Uh, Lewis was a small h hierarchalist. He believed in hierarchy, um, but not not in the, the harmful imperial kind of conquest sense. But things have their place. Things have their order. And uh, of course, our God is a God of good order. We wouldn't have the I if he wasn't. Um, and so I think that um, having things in the right perspective, in the right place is, is uh, deeply important. And that's what we're going to find here. Mm. I'm really looking forward to this discussion about patriotism because earlier this week, somebody posted a quotation graphic on one of the C.S. Lewis Facebook groups about how love of country, when it becomes a god, becomes a demon, and people lost their minds. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. And, and waded in with their opinions when it's very clear that they hadn't actually even read the four loves. So I'm just going to have to send them this link afterwards. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, we're here to serve. <laughs> <laughs> and here is my 100-word summary of the text which we're going to be reading today. Lewis examines another love for something less than human, love of country. He analyzes the different ingredients in patriotism, love of home, the sense of one's country's history, national superiority, as well as the subsequent rights and duties, and how each can corrupt. He identifies issues with loving our country because it is great, rather than because it's ours. To those who are dispensed with patriotism entirely, Jack asks them with what would it be replaced? And Lewis ends by saying that the kind of love he has described here could equally be applied to love of a school, regiment, family, class, church, or religious group. So let's dig into the text itself. But before we get started, how do you guys feel about the word patriotism? As I've alluded to earlier, I've met some people who think that it's an unqualified good, others who think it's an unqualified evil. So what kind of connotations and baggage does it have for you? Huh. Matt, I don't know. What about you? Overall, I still have quite positive connotations with it. I can see where people could have some negative ones nowadays with this being conflated more with superiority, but the genuine sense of patriotism, at least as it is in my definition wheelhouse, I think it's a virtue still. The type of patriotism that takes you out of yourself, something beyond yourself, uh, but not greater than God, uh, putting others ahead of yourself. And so I still, I still hold it in a positive sense, but when it comes to superiority, which I do see sometimes, then that's kind of negative. For me, it's a little conflicted. Uh, you know, of course, it comes from the Greek word for patris, for father, and speaks of the fatherland. And um, I can't help but go back again and again to screw tapes uh, comment. Should we make him, should we make our patient an extreme patriot or an extreme pacifist? All extremes except extreme devotion to the enemy are to be encouraged. And so, you know, I mean, I think that there's um, it, it, there's some baggage with the word patriot, especially in in our day and in our country, and and in fact around the world, there's some baggage with the idea of patriarchy. Um, and I'm not weighing in on one side or the other. What I'm saying is, the enemy wants us to get angry at each other, and in small ways and large, alienate and even hate each other, and. He wants us to be so consumed with our love of country that we forget even a little bit the love of God. And so for me, it always needs to kind of jostle its way into its proper place uh, in in our natural loves and and also in our own kind of understanding and how we operate in terms of being people of the kingdom. Um, the last couple of election cycles have convinced me that the kingdom of Christ is the real constituency in which I am most interested. <laughs> Yeah, for myself, it's definitely complicated for the fact that I am English, but I live in another country, which means I sort of have dual allegiances. But at the same time, living in a foreign country, there is nothing that will make you more patriotic than being surrounded by foreigners the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> Colonists, right? Yes, exactly. But let's get to the text. Uh, and Lewis begins by saying that we all know how patriotism can go wrong. We've just said that. And how it can become a demon if it's allowed to become a god. And he says that in light of this, some people suspect that patriotism is itself just simply demonic. And given his historical context, it's not surprising that people would say this. This was the generation that endured not one, but two world wars. Mm -hmm. But surprisingly, Lewis points out that if we reject patriotism entirely... We actually have to throw away Christ's lament over Jerusalem because 
At least according to Lewis, he too exhibits love for his country. And this is that passage in Matthew and Luke's gospel where Jesus approaches the city and says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Hmm. So that's one reason why he says we can't reject patriotism entirely. And he says that the other reason is that if you reject it, you'd have to reject half the high poetry and half the heroic action our race has achieved. Hmm. So I wanted to turn it back to you guys. What do you make of this statement? And what are these heroic actions that he's got in mind? And same with the high poetry. Why do we have to jettison it? And why is it a bad thing? You know, I think that if you look at the history of Western civilization, it's in some ways a history of kind of bouncing between extremes. And whether it's in the church or or in our in our own civil conversations, most of the new countries, in fact, the fact that that we are a country that rejected England and went to war in order to be free of them, uh, were in some ways advances um, against some of the tyranny that we had faced. And so these political movements are addressing, I think, real human needs. They become codified, they become solidified, they become calcified, and then people begin putting that good thing of liberty of taxation with representation, for example. Um, you can't quarter your British troops in our homes, you know. Um, and those are good things, but then they always want to edge to, to take the importance that our faith and the object of our faith, the Lord, should have. And so that's screw tape going to be at work in the world. If there's a political movement that allows for more freedom for people, God loves that. Um, but then screw tape, knowing that God loves that, is going to try to corrupt or twist or bend things. I'm so glad that we did screw tape before we started talking about this chapter particularly. <laughs> yeah, that's well said. I have I have nothing to add to that. That's what I was going to say too. <laughs> well, and there's lots of great poetry about. It's I mean, a true statement, guys. <laughs> <laughs> you'd have to throw out the Iliad. You'd have to throw out the Aeneid. You'd have to throw out so many great, um, uh, so much of the great poetry that came out of. Um, the English Reformation, and you'd have to throw out a lot of poetry that lauds the greatness of of, of one's country. I mean, you'd have to throw out Walt Whitman, uh, I Too Sing America, Langston Hughes. I mean, the grappling with country uh, produces great art because when we grapple with, with love um, and when we get at those hard issues, it's going to produce art. We want to sing about what we uh, what we care about. So I think that, if, surprisingly, I'm going to side with Lewis on this one. <laughs> <laughs> and if somebody says isn't into uh, poetry, uh, just think of it this way. We would have to get rid of the movie 300. And that is just something I am not willing to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. Never seen it. Well, before we attempt to praise or dispraise, we should probably define and describe. Good idea. And that's exactly what Lewis does next, outlining what he is and isn't going to be talking about with regards to patriotism. He says he's not going to discuss international ethics or what constitutes right or wrong foreign policy. Rulers are the ones who deal internationally, but he really cares about citizens. And he does point out that rulers can often act wickedly more easily if the populace have a demonic form of patriotism. And the reverse is also true. True virtue in the people can help keep the rulers on the straight and narrow. And he says, this is one reason why we private persons should keep a wary eye on the health or disease of our own love of our country. And so in today's episode, Lewis is going to focus on distinguishing an individual's innocent patriotism from its demonic counterpart. It may be helpful to think about the three types of morality from uh, mere Christianity, mm -hmm. um, where we talk about my own internal morality as a person. Uh, the, the, he, he uses that brilliant ship metaphor. Um, if my steering is going wrong, I'm going to crash into other ships. That's my personal morality. Then there's the social morality. If the social morality isn't good, the ships are going to crash into each other, right? If they are not unified and all sailing in the same direction, they're going to crash into each other. So how people act on the outside as a society uh, has its morality. And then, of course, the third type of morality is where we're all going, the roadmap. Right. And so people can be very true to a cause. The cause can be very united. 
but it can be going in a de demonic direction, right? I mean, you think about maybe um, the worst abuses of communist North Korea or something, where there's personal adherence, there's social adherence, but they're heading in a bad direction. And so I think that's part of maybe what's what's going on here. Um, as he's talking about patriotism, it's a good thing in its place, but is it headed in the right direction? And I'm going to add somewhat of a litmus test in today's political environment where there's it's so extreme on each side of which one you fall under. Patriotism can be like love of country and not, and we're talking very generally here, but if I'm thinking of a healthy patriotism within your own political party too, I feel like a healthy one is is a type of individual that desires their party to be the best it can be. And I can tell you right now to burst everyone's bubble, neither are perfect. And so if you're looking at your party and like, I wish they would do this better, but I like this. And an unhealthy version would be everything your specific party does is the best and everything the other party does is terrible. Like that's just not true, unfortunately. And it's it's like that quote that a politician said, if you agree with nine out of 12 things, I say vote for me. If you agree with 12 out of 12 things, go seek an insane asylum. Like yeah. you just, there's just no way every party is doing everything great. So to me, that's the litmus test. If you're like, my party is everything 100% and not, you might want to actually check your level of healthiness with the patriotism. You know, I may be meddling some, but I wonder if the same could be said of denomination. Um, and I say that in the presence of a couple of Catholics, and I understand the uh, the teaching on the magisterium. But if I'm more concerned about the magisterium than I am about Christ— and I understand that an argument can be made that you can't and that the two are connected. Hear me. I, I get that. But then there are lots of Christians who don't hold to that. And how can we, in, a, in an age of denominational diversity, get along with each other? And I think Lewis, again, has the, the key where he says, at her center where her truest children dwell, something or someone speaks with the same voice. And so the differences should be celebrated and... Uh, and not be made uh, for you know as as weapons to you know with which to fight each other. And I think that the same could be said you know of politics as well. I love the fact that we didn't even have to say anything. We just let Andrew argue with himself. It was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> well, and honestly, Andrew, the, the comment I'd say with that too is is I I completely agree. I mean, even if I think the magisterium kind of thing. I, there's, I have tons of critiques with the Catholic faith in terms of emphasis, implementation. I mean, it's one thing to have a whole core set of teachings. Which ones are priority? How do you treat, treat people? How do you implement them? I mean, there's a lot of flaws and ways things slip up even within my own denomination. And I, I look at other denominations, I say, man, they do that way better than us. Or man, I wish we could do that because it's so beautiful what that denomination is bringing to the Christian faith with what they're emphasizing. And sometimes, so I agree with you completely. Um, all right, you're yeah. ecumenical hippies. Let's push on with the text. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I just think that if we can pivot to the text with this, if I'm more interested in being an Episcopalian than I am in being a follower of Christ, something has a first thing has become a second thing, and a second thing has become a first thing. And I think the same thing. If I'm more interested in being a citizen of the United States than a citizen of heaven, the enemy has, has made some progress with me, and I need some adjustments. So we talked a lot around patriotism, and one of the things that Lewis then goes to next is saying that it is something of an ambivalent term. It's a mixture of different ideas and elements. And for proof of this, he points to both Rudyard Kipling and G.K. Chesterton, because they both praised patriotism. Hopefully, G.K. Chesterton needs no introduction, since everyone here listens to my wife's podcast, Pints with <laughs> Chesterton, which, funnily enough, they're going through orthodoxy at the moment, and that has much to say on the subject of patriotism. But my question is, who is Rudyard Kipling? Uh, Rudyard Kipling, um, the Jungle Book? Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yep, that's the one. Which is way um, weirder than the cartoon. I do have to point that out if anybody yes. wants to crack that open. Um, and also um, Invictus, I believe he wrote the poem Invictus, and was kind of a colonialist, so he comes under fire these days. But I think it was Kipling that Lewis was quoting when he said, I would play tambourine with my toes on a street corner uh, if I thought it would win, win one more soul to Christ. I believe that that was Kipling. So Kipling, a late uh, 19th century author um, and one of, uh, one of those authors that Lewis read widely and well. 
Yeah, he was a he was a journalist. We mentioned writer as well and poet and all the stuff that everybody seemed to do back then, but not today. <laughs> uh, but what is the significance of Lewis drawing on the fact that both Kipling and Cheston praise patriotism? How does that show that it is something of an ambivalent term? I think it has to do with um, how patriotic Kipling was and how centered on the Catholic Church um, Chesterton was. And they're both Englishmen, and they're both coming at it from very different perspectives, but they can agree on on this love of country um, would be kind of my stab. But I'd love to hear y'all's thoughts. The image that came to my mind was that it's rather like coffee or beer. It's a term that covers an awful lot. And someone could say, try an IPA, you know, a really hoppy IPA, and conclude that, oh, I don't like beer. But what it really is, is that there, there were elements in what they received that they didn't like. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think there is something of that in patriotism. Patriotism is itself made up of many elements. And there can be some good elements, some bad elements, and some good elements that are overused. You know, hops in beer is good, but overusing them turns it into a revolting mess. <laughs> is that you coming out against the double extra hoppy IPAs? Absolutely. An abomination <laughs> to God and man. <laughs> I don't know that I'd go that far, but I like something far more malty than, uh, than hoppy myself. Mm -hmm. And so I'd have to agree with you. Give me a fuller ZSB any day. <laughs> Well, Lewis spends the rest of this chapter really looking at the different ingredients or elements of patriotism. And his first ingredient is love of home, which he says is the love of the place we grew up in, of all the places near, love of old acquaintances, of familiar sights, sounds, and smells. And according to Lewis, the largest unit of size allowed here is England, Northern Ireland, Scotland, or Wales. And he takes a bit of a jab at foreigners and politicians who want <laughs> to talk about Britain. <laughs> yeah. The text then takes what I initially thought to be a little bit of a swerve. It's a bit of an odd move because earlier we mentioned Rudyard Kipling and Lewis now comments that his claim that I do not love my empire's foes strikes a ludicrously false note. So my question is, what has this got to do with love of home? And also, why does Lewis think that this is ridiculous? I don't know, Matt. What do you think? Well, honestly, I'm not entirely sure on the whole loving your foes part of it. But I will say with this love of home section, what really started to jump out with me is Lewis, and this connects a lot with what Andrew has been talking about in, in general in my time of knowing you, Andrew, on this podcast, but family offers a first step beyond love of ourself. But then to go beyond family, uh, patriotism done in the right sense allows us to go beyond that as well. And so when I think of like a genuine patriotism and a love of home, if it's done in a way that's taking us outside of ourselves, I think there's a positiveness to it. If it's taking us, if it's like our enemies are people we hate, now there's a pride and there's an arrogance and there's a pitting against each other. And so I think it's important to ask ourselves which way is the love going? Is it taking us out of ourselves or is it turning us within ourselves in a negative sense? Yeah. No, absolutely. And that's what I keep harping on, you know, to go out of ourselves towards another is the definition that Lewis uses for love not uh, not long before this in the in the, the script that becomes the four loves. I can't help but thinking of uh, my time in graduate school at Rice, where they divided up students into residential colleges, and they get to Rice, which is a huge achievement. It's a great undergraduate school, and they're just so happy to be there. And then they just get sorted, kind of like with a sorting hat, into their different <laughs> colleges. And then I saw a picture in the paper, like three days into orientation week, there's this rally, and these people, these kids, are screaming at people from the other college. I'm in Sid Brown College. I'm in Will Rice College. And they're just like furious at each other, flipping each other off. And I'm like... Oh my gosh. And this is an example of this kind of patriotism. If you think of patriotism in the sense of belonging to an organization larger than myself and being loyal to it. And so immediately they had created a sense of identity about where you actually sleep. And that became a huge deal. I can't wait till we get to next week because Lewis then pivots from this talk about patriotism to, to talk about the love that drives patriotism, which is Storgi, which is I'm chomping at the bit to get there. <laughs> when I read that phrase, I do not love my empire's foes, it reminded me of a comedy sketch from a duo back in England where somebody was a football fan and his team won. And he was talking to the other guy as though he was actually playing about what we did 
and what you did. He associated mm-hmm. himself with this other team and, and drew his identity into it. So I think there is that, that level of ridiculousness when we talk about my empire. But Lewis has just said that the largest unit of size we're allowed is England, Wales, Scotland, or Northern Ireland. And you can't really have patriotism for an empire because he says that uh, with this love of place, there goes a love of the way of life for beer and tea and open fires, trains with compartments in them, and an unarmed police force and all the rest of it for Mm -hmm. the local dialect and for a shade less for our native language. So it it kind of necessarily needs to be smaller than an empire. Mm -hmm. And he also quotes Chesterton afterwards saying that a man wouldn't want foreigners ruling his country for the same reason he wouldn't want his house burned down. There's just far too many things that he would miss. Now, we've painted a pretty black picture thus far. So what actually is kind of good about this love of home? And Lewis says that as family offers us the first step beyond self-love, so this love of home offers us the first step beyond family selfishness. Mm -hmm. But he says that this isn't pure charity which is a bit of a loaded phrase. Mm. So what do, you, what do you make of this statement that you know, our family offers us a step beyond self-love and now this love of home offers us a step beyond that? My guess would be based on what he talks about in the next part of this, of how the natural loves can be training grounds for the spiritual loves. When we get that step outside of ourselves, yes, there's charity towards the other person, but like anything, it's actually somewhat indirectly helping us too. The more we learn to love beyond ourselves and be love beyond our family, to love the other, we're actually kind of indirectly benefiting from it. We're training the muscles, the disciplines that allow us to eventually have the spiritual uh, practices or loves better. I really think of St. Ignatius' spiritualities here with, uh, <clears throat> he talks about physical loves or physical desolation and consolation and spiritual desolation and consolation, those two go very hand in hand. So when we're training our natural muscles or the physical muscles, it it very much relates to our spiritual life as well. So there's some selfish benefit, honestly. Well, and this is part of why the next chapter is going to be so, so full. And listeners, if you're still struggling through chapters one and two, stay with it. This is good thinking, and it really is going to unfold We hear all the time that there's no greater love than than a mother's love. And you may hear in some circles, there's no greater love than the love of your country. Both of those statements are nonsense. Both of those statements are lies. There is a greater love than mother's love, and that's the love of God. And so the enemy's always going to try and have us trade a second thing for a first thing. And so this love of home is absolutely good until it makes me harden my heart. This love of home is great until it makes me let off the people in my family when they're wrong instead of demanding that they live righteously, right? Um, Making excuses for them. Or until it makes me favor members of my own family to the detriment of remembering that I'm a part of Christ's body and I'm part of the human family. If all I'm concerned with is my family and not Christ's body and not the human family, then I think the enemy may have won a small victory there. He's taught, he's defeated me by the love that I have. And so I always have to be examining my loves and make sure that making sure that they're proportional in the same way that my love of my friends is good. But if I'm going out with my friends every night and not paying attention to, to my wife, I've gotten things out of order. And so I think it's a question of order here that Lewis is getting at. If you're spending too much time recording a podcast on C.S. Lewis and not spending enough time with your wife, we got an issue. And as a matter of fact, uh, David and Matt were very gracious last night. Instead of recording this podcast, I went with my wife to not to leave her alone and babysat my niece and my nephew. And uh, <laughs> and so I was I was favoring my wife instead of favoring my friends and my loyal my filia friends and my loyalty storge to uh, to pints with Jack. Um, and fortunately, they were gracious and forgiving. Well, let's wrap up this first ingredient in patriotism with a few more assessments. Lewis asks, is this kind of patriotism aggressive? He says, no, it just wants to be left alone. He says it only becomes militant when it's wanting to try and protect things that it loves. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting what he says as to how this fosters an attitude towards foreigners. He says it's actually rather good. And this is probably one of my favorite quotations in the whole book. He says, how can I love my home without coming to realize that other men, no less rightly, love theirs? Once you've realized that the Frenchman likes café complet just as we like bacon and eggs, well, good luck to them and let them have at it. The last <laughs> thing we want is to make everywhere else just like our own home. It would not be home unless it were different.
Yes. Yes. Oh, that's great. I hate to be a little bit down here, but like, I, I feel like in today's climate so often there's, we're going to get to the superiority section a little bit later, but we, we want everyone to be like us. And I think it's a little bit unfortunate. I don't think we'd want it exactly the same. Yeah, and we actually live in a very different culture. I think Lewis would be baffled by the homogeneity of the world where everybody reads the same news and everybody can get the same food and everything. The kind of provinciality of each individual country and even each different county or part of the country um, has, has in large part been lost. Well... Next up, Jack says the second ingredient in patriotism relates to how our country's past is viewed. Not so much as strict history, but in the popular imagination. And he cites examples such as Marathon, which was a major Greek victory in antiquity against the Persians, and the Battle of Waterloo, where we gave Napoleon and the French a good thrashing. Uh, how does our sense of history impact our patriotism? I think it helps pretty greatly with keeping... The same way truth casts out a lot of things, the same thing in history, truth can cast out a lot of false impressions. And it's someone like, I, I spent time studying in Israel, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I've spent time in Nicaragua for an entire summer. I studied a lot that happened there uh, throughout history many, many decades ago. And I will tell you what, the United States foreign intervention is not always uh, flawless and it's not always perfect. And that doesn't necessarily that you know I still have a deep love for the United States and I think overall what we strive to be and our values is a wonderful and a beautiful thing. But at the same time, it can be tempered with the understanding that we are flawed humans trying to implement this and uh, mistakes happen. And so I think it it just pushes more towards a genuine sense of the word patriotism if you really have a a, a sober and true understanding of history. Well, and you look at the history of, of England and the deposition of the kings and the, the reign of the parliament, and I think that in order to kind of understand what makes up a country, you know its history. And you know we have these kind of conflicting ideas of when to start history uh, in, in recently, and I don't want to stir up a pot of trouble, but you know the 1619 project and the 1776 project, and once again, I'm not here taking sides. What I'm saying is history and what pieces of history help contribute to the narrative that we tell ourselves about our country. That is all well and good as long as it continues to help me forget myself to loving others. And most of all, as long as it helps me grapple with the idea of the love of God and how to love him. And the moment that I become hard-hearted towards anybody else because of my history, that's the moment that it's gone astray. I think history also is teleological. It is going towards a telos or an end. And the end of history is when every tribe and every tongue and every nation kneels before the throne of Christ and confesses him as Lord. And so if my nation's history is edging me towards that eventual fate, it's good. If it's not, then you know I'm, <laughs> I may have to look at it, although those ways are, are complex and circuitous. The way Lewis puts it is that it gives us an obligation and an assurance that we can't fall below the standard of our ancestors, but also because we're their descendants, uh, we've got a good hope that we're not going to screw up, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, because we are English, because we are from the United States, whatever your country. Yeah. And he says that this particular ingredient in patriotism doesn't have quite such a good, uh, good history, literally, as love of home. Because he says that the actual history of every country is full of some pretty shabby and some pretty shameful doings. Mm -hmm. And he says that this will either result in a whitewashing of history or mm -hmm. it'll just produce disillusioned cynics. But he then goes ahead and suggests a way of having our cake and eating it too. Mm -hmm. How we can be empowered by the past, but also not deceived or puffed up by it. Mm -hmm. How does he say that we can do that? Well, I think that we need to kind of separate history from what we learn in school and from what we're taught at home. I think that we should think about and be willing to hear about the shabby things. And that's something that our, that our country is grappling, that this country, America, is grappling with right now. Some of what's going on is about the history of racism. And once again, I'm not making a political statement, 
But there are some things in our past of which, you know, didn't produce, you know, a, a beautiful and, and, and loving society for all. And so I think that looking honestly about those and kind of defining and describing what actually happening, what happens and to do it dispassionately, that's part of where I think we're going astray a little bit is we're so passionate about which side that we're on. But I think the dispassion of saying these actual things actually happened and here are the results or the, here are the, the, the reasons for it and the results of it, then how do we pick up from here and make what Lincoln called a more perfect union? You know, how do we bind up the wounds and how do we, you know, how do we look towards healing and how do we make our country echo, at least in a little bit, the, the heavenly city that's coming down for Jerusalem, the, the heavenly kingdom? Lewis says that this often leads to a third element, which is also sometimes called patriotism. And that's the belief that my own country has long been and still is markedly superior to all others. Mm. And Lewis recounts a, a conversation that he had with an old clergyman expressing this sort of view. Jack says, but sir, aren't we told that every people thinks their own men the bravest and their own women the fairest in all the world? And this clergyman responds with the gravity of a religious declaration. Yes, but in England, it's true. <laughs> now, personally, I don't see any problem with the statement at all. <laughs> but according to Lewis, what's the problem with this kind of unfettered view of one's country? It pits you against the other. Uh, I just think of his cha his chapter in Mere Christianity on pride. If the, the danger of pride is it's me against you. It's it's not bringing people together. He talks about in there sins that sometimes of the flesh that bring people together are, are aren't even as bad because at least it's not saying I'm better than you or doing that. And so I think that any any sort of superiority right away, if you're looking down on someone, you're having a hard time looking up. And I've always loved that expression. And I think that our Lord is right that we should judge a tree by its fruit. And so I, if my love of America, and fr frankly, my love of England, I'm a quarter English, and I love so many English things. If my love of those, I'm half Cuban, if my love of my ethnicity helps me to love others, and helps me to understand natural love, and helps me with pleasures of appreciation. If those things, if it's producing good fruit, it's a good thing. If it begins to produce a negative fruit, then it's a negative thing. And so St. Paul said to the pure, all things are pure. All things are lawful for me, but all, not all things are profitable for me. And so when it comes to country, it's what's profiting me, what's making me a better Christian, what's making me a better person, um, what's helping me to be you know, more caring. Um, those are the things that I should set my heart after. Now, do you think that there can be legitimate soft forms of superiority? For example, can a country be the best in the world at food or beer? Sure. Sure, but what do you mean by best? <laughs> and what do you mean by food? Right? Define and describe. Right. Yeah. And to allow for personal taste, right? And, and we can say that The Great Divorce is Lewis's best book, but that doesn't mean we're pitting ourselves against Andrew. <laughs> no, it just means you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody well out there, said. now's the time to drink because it came up, and I'm sure you have a drinking game about this coming up. <laughs> well said, Andrew. Well, I've heard it's good to defuse things with humor. I had uh, looked up the joke that says, in heaven, the police are British, the cooks are French, the engineers are German, and the administrators are Swiss, and the lovers are Italian. Whereas <laughs> in hell, the police are German, the cooks are British, the engineers are Italian, the administrators are French, and the lovers are the Swiss. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. And where are the Americans in here? That's what I was waiting <laughs> yeah. for the whole time. <laughs> well, since, since they're the majority of our listeners, I thought I'd play that safe. <laughs> Absolutely. We're still in purgatory. <laughs> so from superiority, we then come to a fourth ingredient or element. Lewis writes, if our nation really is so much better than the others, it may be held to either the duties or rights of a superior being towards them. And in the 19th century, the English thought a lot about this with regards to their empire. It was called the white man's burden. And many want to call this kind of self-appointed guardianship of the world purely hypocritical. But Lewis actually doesn't think it was all hypocrisy or a complete failure. But he does say that all the altruistic rhetoric of the empire and people joining the Indian civil service, it made the rest of the world want to be sick. And the real problem is, is that if you view yourself as having rights over other people, the question is, what happens if you think they're so bad that you can subjugate or exterminate them? And Jack says that 
if the results weren't so terrible, it would just be hilarious. And he gives a number of examples of different scandals. I'm just going to list the ones that he lists. Broken treaties with <clears throat> Redskins, extermination of the Tasmanians, Belson, Amritsar, Black and Tans, and Apartheid. Oh, yeah. Um, these are all examples, I think, of asserting political authority or superiority in a way that's just detrimental and evil and wrong, yeah? Mm -hmm. And almost always ending in an awful lot of bloodshed. And interestingly, this this mention of Belson brings up a poem that Lewis writes about space travel. And he's like, why should we, and I'm grossly paraphrasing, uh, why should we be so eager to fling the horrors of our world on a nation? Why do we, or on another planet? Why would we want to go and populate another planet if we perpetrated Auschwitz and Belsen? Belsen's one of the German concentration camps. You know, what's so great about us? Shouldn't we rather stay here and uh, and think about what we've done? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and that actually kind of works out in Out of the Silent Planet. Yeah. You see people rushing to the stars only to try and perpetuate all of the evils that they committed also on Earth. One of the things that we're seeing right now is is grappling with the legacy of slavery. You know, I'm seeing it at my seminary. You know, we're seeing it all over the, all over the country. And slavery was a sin and perpetrated many, many evils in this country. I think the enemy triumphed by the way, by the inhumanness of so many aspects of that. And that's not something as a nation that we can necessarily be proud of. The enemy wants us to grapple with those things and then hate each other, justify ourselves, let ourselves off the hook, be angry and resentful forever. The enemy wants anything but a loving reaction um, uh, to that. What the Lord wants is us to look at our sins and our flaws and fall upon the mercy of the cross and say, this is how I am without the help of the grace of God. This is what we do to each other without the grace of God. God hasten the day when he heals it by establishing the patriotism of the kingdom of heaven here on earth. Well, in the final part of the chapter, Lewis says that we reach the stage where patriotism in its demoniac form unconsciously denies itself. To explain what he means, he references two men we've mentioned today already, G.K. Cheston and Rudyard Kipling. And Lewis seems to think that Cheston did this a little unfairly, but in his book Heretics, he quotes two lines from one of Kipling's poems, which characterizes this demonic form of patriotism. Come on, read it in your best cockney, David. <laughs> if England was what England seems, our quick we'd drop her, but she ain't. <laughs> it's that expression, my country right or wrong. Mm. That's, a, that's an expression from hell, right? I want the rightness that comes from Christ that I cannot do for myself, and I want that for me and for my country. What does Chesterton say, though? What he writes in Heretics is he says, he admires England, but does not love her. We admire things with reasons, but love them without reasons. Hmm. He admires England because she is strong, not because she is English. Hmm. Well, I think Matt and I agree that it's right not to love England. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, Matt, what's the, what's the problem with, with this attitude expressed in Kipling's poem? It's not really love at all. Why? It's, it's conditional. He says it's like loving your children only if they're good, or your wife just as long as she keeps her looks, or your husband just as long as he remains famous and successful. Well, which is skipping ahead to the end of the book, which is skipping ahead to, to agape and to love, uh, for, to decision love, unconditional love. You can see in these first couple of chapters that Lewis is really setting up the arguments that he will lay out in the, in the next four. It's just going to be so rich. Yeah, I think the fundamental problem with the attitude that's being expressed is that if you love based on merit, well, what happens when that merit decreases or is discovered to be less than it was previously thought? Mm -hmm. The love dies. Mm -hmm. And Jack says, uh, the kind of patriotism which sets off with the greatest swagger of drums and banners actually sets off on the road that can lead to Vichy. And Matt, you told me before this that you looked up Vichy. What's Vichy? <laughs> I appreciate you teeing it up as Vichy because I would have said Vichy. <laughs> uh, so I'm glad I didn't have to deal with that uh, embarrassment. But from what I found, it was it was um, this name for the French state that was headed by this gentleman, uh, started with a P and another P, uh, during World War II. <laughs> I can't remember what his name was. <laughs> I think it was Philip or something. 
Uh, but anyways, it was a bad regime that ended up collaborating with the Nazis. Philippe Pétain. See, I remember. <laughs> I remember part of this. Yes. Uh, so yes, when it says all roads lead to VJ, it's, it's almost it's, it's a very negative statement. I would interpret it as based on what I had read by it. Yeah, it ends up being a hatred of com- country uh, treachery. And then Lois draws out the point that we'll continue to encounter. When the natural loves become lawless, they do not merely harm the other loves. They themselves cease to be loves that they were, to be loves at all. Yeah. And how quickly love ceases to be love. And that really, you know, that really shows the screw tapes at work, I think. And so after looking at all of these different ingredients and elements, Jack concludes that patriotism has got many faces. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the title of another book that you wrote. Uh, and <laughs> while some people might want to get rid of patriotism entirely, Lewis says that they don't think about what might replace it. What, what, Matt, what's the problem here that he says if we try and dispense with patriotism? Where, where does that end up? What's the dilemma that we then face? I mean, ultimately, if we go back to his statement that family takes us out of ourselves and patriotism takes us out of our family, I think you just you, you slowly turn back inward when you remove those layers. And I think love of God takes us away from patriotism. You know, if you think of that as the next step, you know, going from yourself to your family unit, to your country, to your citizen of heaven. You know, if you think of those tiers and you get rid of them, you slowly fall back and the next tier becomes everything. And so I actually think you can make too much of God of the family unit. And so honestly, in some countries, I think we, we do lift that up. I think the family unit is incredibly important towards a functioning society. But if you don't, if you put it ahead of everything else, I think that can also be a little bit dangerous. And so I think of it in those tiers and you don't, you want, you need all of them, honestly. I'm trying to remember the quote. I think it's from this book. Uh, he quotes somebody, it may even be Chesterton. He says, when, when the real God comes, the half gods go. And Lewis says, no, when the real God comes, the half gods can be free to take their proper place. So there's first and second things too. Patriotism is one of the loves and it's a good one, right? In the kingdom of heaven, when we're gathered around the throne, I don't think that all the Americans and all the British will have their different parts. I don't think that we'll be segregated. It'll be like, oh, wow, you're from England. Tell me how you loved Christ there. Oh, you're the ones who started the Alpha Course. Oh, fantastic. Oh, you're from America. This is where, you know, this is where the Passion Conference came from or whatever it is. Um, I think that that the half God of patriotism will take its proper place when we put King Jesus on his when we acknowledge that King Jesus is on his throne and and make sure that we 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 honor him as there. Well, personally, I think there might be some segregation. Otherwise, how would you know where the good beer was? Well, I'm going to go hang out with the British, but they will <laughs> welcome me. There'll be plenty of good there beer there. Go. Right there, you go. Um, or welcoming segregation. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, in the text, the issue that Lewis presents is that, well, if we get rid of patriotism, from time to time, nations are going to be subject to threats, and the rulers need to encourage their people to some kind of defense. And if you dispense with patriotism, every conflict has to be urged on purely ethical grounds, justice, civilization, humanity as a whole. And Lewis is suspicious of that kind of idealism and where it ends up. And he, he explains it using the examples of two different songs, Land of Hope and Glory and the British Grenadiers. And his point is that when something is motivated by patriotism, you still know that it's still something of a sentiment and is therefore something that can be taken a little lightly. Whereas when you dispense with that and everything has to be done purely on justice, it can be elevated to kind of like a a, a religious holy war. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's like Lewis's second best book, right? I was thinking about uh, what Lewis will say about the animals and that the animals are raised... Uh, with us too. Anything that we purely love um, or love in a godly way, I think will be in heaven with us. And um, every one of those people in the great divorce loved something. You know, the bishop loved theological reflection and that's good, but he loved his part in it more than he loved, uh, than he loved God's part in it. And so I think God will graciously give us all things, you know, uh, give up yourselves and, and he will give you everything, you know, he'll give you heaven and with heaven, everything else thrown in, right? And so uh, patriotism taking its right place, we get all the best of it without having to throw, uh, throw anything away, I think. And as we wrap up this chapter, 
Jack points out the applicability of patriotism. Not only could it describe love of country, but love of school, love of regiment, family, class, church, or group within a church. All the good and the bad still apply. And it's worth noting here that our love taxonomy just got, yet again, a little bit more complicated. <laughs> but he says he doesn't really want to talk about the stuff that's gone wrong in the church. And he says, if I ever write the book that I'm not going to write, it'll basically be a, a confession of Christianity for how we've added to the world's ills and sufferings. Mm -hmm. And then he wraps up the chapter by saying that uh, he's not going to deal with animals yet. He's going to deal with them in the next chapter when he discusses affection, because he says whether animals are in fact subpersonal or not, they are never loved as if they were. Hmm. Oh my gosh, so rich. This is such good, such good stuff, such good thinking. And that I would encourage you to, uh, to, to keep your copy of Till We Have Faces at hand because it's an, exactly an example of what happens when love becomes a god. Or Wall's love for Psyche uh, becomes a god. Her hatred of herself becomes a god. All of these things get twisted, but they come right in the end as I hope they will for us. Well, it's closing time here at The Eagle and Child. Thank you to all of our listeners, our Patreon supporters, particularly our top tier supporters, Bud, Shane, John, Kevin, Brian, Kay, Monique, Paul, Kimberly, Gillis, Gary, Stephen, Matt, Jeff, Kelly, Chris, John, Kate, Peter, David, and Rowdy. And if you guys haven't yet, please go check out the YouTube channel. We have a lot more people that are here than there. And David is kicking out great content on the Skype sessions. Go check out the Instagram, the Facebook, the Twitter, the Slack channel. If you guys support us at $5 a month or more, you get to join the Slack channel. And I have to say this, this season, it has been the most robust I have ever seen it. The intellectual discussions happening on a daily basis blow my mind and remind me constantly that David should replace me with someone from our Slack community because they are way more intelligent than myself. And also write us a review, iTunes, Audible, Podbean, fantastic uh, places to be able to leave some feedback for us and let us read those. Uh, visit our revamped website. David worked hard on that and get some merchandise. So please join us next time. When we'll be going further up and further in. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers, friends. <laughs>